Dear participants, welcome to this symposium about the legacy of CGIR research program on water, land, and ecosystems. I'm Marcela Quintero. I work for the Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIAD, and I'm also one of the flagship uh, leaders of WLE. After a 10-year journey of this program, WLE, then this is coming to an end, and we want to celebrate its contribution to science-driven solutions for managing sustainably our water, land, soils, and ecosystems, key foundation of our food systems. Building on WLE legacy, as well as reflecting on the future, is important for the next research for development efforts. So today, in this symposium, we, want, we will focus on one hand, highlighting some of those innovations that were created within the context of WLE. And on the other one, we want to listen to reflections from people that have been involved in critical thinking around future efforts in research. And at the same time, we will also listen to the next generation of scientists. So without extending more, I want to welcome Dr. Roberto Lenton. Dr. Lenton is the chair of the Board of Governors of the International Water Management Institute, IMI, and former Director General of IMI. Dr. Lenton will offer opening remarks for this symposium. So welcome, Dr. Lenton. Over to you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, <clears throat> Marcela, for that uh, introduction. Um, and thank you to Stefan and uh, all those involved in organizing this uh, symposium for inviting me to uh, to share some reflections with you. It's really a, a great opportunity to uh, <clears throat> to spend some time uh, with you uh, very briefly um, and reflect on uh, <clears throat> on what uh, WLE has achieved and its implications for the future. Um, and the title I thought was was perfect uh, for the occasion, and it led me to reflect a little bit about what uh, WRD's uh, legacy in the larger context context is, and that's what I really wanted to uh, spend a few <clears throat> minutes with you uh, this uh, at this time. Um, I guess the the first and and undoubtedly the most important legacy in in my mind, um, is the impact that WLE science um, and the results from it have had on people uh, <clears throat> around the world, and particularly the most vulnerable, the impacts on the lives and livelihoods of poor people around the world, um, and of course, uh, its impacts on the planet. Um, and and WLE has done a really fantastic job, in my view, of really documenting those impacts and reporting uh, <clears throat> with clear evidence on the outcomes and impacts of its work. Um, and so whether it is uh, pastoral uh, <clears throat> uh, people in Ethiopia helped as a result of WLE's work on, uh, on, on capturing floodwaters or its small farmers in India benefiting uh, from the work on solar powered irrigation, for example, um, there's really been very well documented impacts of WLE's scientific work, which is going to um, undoubtedly be its most important legacy. Um, but there are a couple more that I thought would be important uh, to share with you. Um, and one of them is the impact on the participating institutions. Um, WLE has brought together uh, many uh, institutions, both within the CGIR and outside, and it's clearly had an impact. It's had an impact on IMI um, that I'm representing at this, uh, at this gathering. It's had an, an impact on the wider CGIR. Um, and even though WLD in budgetary terms has been probably the among the smallest of all the uh, participating of, of all the CRPs, the impact that it's had in terms of the future of the CGIR is quite remarkable because if you look at the new mission of the CGIR with its focus on, <clears throat> on uh, food, land and water systems, um, and if you look at the impact areas 
uh, with its focus uh, of the, among the five on ecosystems, it's clear that the work of WLE has had uh, has helped nudge the CGIR um, and uh, the institutions participating in this direction of a of a broader vision. Clearly, there's still a lot of work to be done on that front. I use the word nudge because there's a lot of work to be done in truly internalizing uh, the new mission and bringing it alive and making it really uh, uh, <clears throat> shape the direction of the CGIR's work in the future. Uh, but that is a very important uh, contribution and part of, I think, WLE's legacy. Um, and the third uh, legacy, in my view, uh, important one, is the impact that it's had on the participating scientists um, and the science leaders. There's no question in my mind that all the results that we'll be talking about um, come about as a result of the work of very dedicated scientists um, and scientists, science leaders working over the last 10 years to produce the results uh, that I've been talking about though, or that we will be talking about today. But at the same time, that work has influenced and shaped and further developed the scientists that have been participating. So an important legacy of WID, it seems to me, is the scientists themselves who will go on to be uh, involved in future activities of the CGIR uh, and, uh, and other institutions in the years to come and therefore have a larger uh, role beyond that. Um, so uh, that's really all I wanted to say uh, with you, uh, to share with you. Um, thanks again for inviting me. Um, I look forward to listening in to the rest of the uh, symposium and back to you, Marcela, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Linton, for your opening remarks. And now we want precisely to, to show you, or to share with you a video about uh, those WLE solutions that has been created during the past 10 years. And this is precisely the science contribution that you have been, Dr. Lenton mentioned it. So please, let's listen to this video. Agriculture is one of humanity's greatest success stories, yet it is also one of the leading causes of environmental degradation and social inequity. For the past decade, the CGIAR research programme on water, land and ecosystems, known as WLE, has been working across the global south to find innovative, affordable and sustainable ways to address this challenge. WLE has worked in over 60 countries, with more than 300 partners, completing over 200 projects, directly benefiting millions of lives. Researchers have developed business models that enable farmers to access solar-powered irrigation, as well as opportunities to generate extra income by selling surplus water and energy. This is a powerful incentive to pump water more efficiently. The approach will be widely adopted across India. To increase the recovery of resources, such as organic matter, from urban waste streams, WLE developed a circular business model approach for entrepreneurs. It resulted in better waste management and benefits to agriculture. Faced with the threat of more frequent destructive flooding, millions of vulnerable farmers are at increased risk in South Asia. Research has resulted in affordable, pro-poor flood insurance that protects farmers' assets and strengthens their resilience to climate change. This model is now being expanded to parts of Africa. WLE has contributed to the greening of degraded landscapes by empowering locals to adopt soil and water conservation practices such as terracing and check dams. These community-driven restoration activities have reduced erosion and increased crop diversity and productivity. Working with partners to improve water management practices, 
WLE has developed solutions to optimise rice fish production systems. These have the potential to transform the productivity, resilience and health of rice producers in Asia. And groundbreaking soil spectral analysis technology has enabled ecosystem health evaluation on a massive scale. This has paved the way for better targeting of land restoration and resulted in more sustainable agricultural practices. These are just a few examples of the positive impact that WLE has created in the Global South over the past decade. Although the programme is coming to an end, these solutions will inform decision makers and policies for years to come. Future investment in innovation to build on WLE's research will make sure that this work continues to enhance climate resilience, protect ecosystems and strengthen food and water security, improving the lives of all, particularly the most vulnerable. Wow, okay, let's now, I think is is after seeing these solutions and what have been achieved by WLE is very exciting, but this WLE solution has not happened in a vacuum. So let's now put these WLE solutions into a broader context, connecting it to global debates around water, land and ecosystem sustainability. For this, I have the honor to welcome Professor Olsai Unger. Professor Umber is faculty member of the Arizona State University, former deputy director of the Land and Water Division at FAO, and also former member of WLE Independent Steering Committee. Professor Umber, welcome. You have 15 minutes for your keynote presentation, and let's help us to connect WLE solutions to the global debate around water, land, and ecosystem. Thank you, Dr. Umber, and over to you. Thank you very much, Marcella, and I'm very happy and touched uh, for this opportunity to, um, to be a part of this legacy symposium. Uh, my professional life um, has a, a good overlap with WLD, um, and uh, I feel that I'm uh, partly uh, qualified to provide um, a recap of WLE's legacy, but this will be from a totally personal perspective. It's not intended to be comprehensive nor um, objective. So please uh, listen to my remarks as such, and uh, and I uh, I apologize if I'm, I'm missing uh, something. Uh, my presentation will be mostly from the perspective of uh, science influencing and informing policy. Uh, and if you allow me to share my screen, I have a short uh, presentation to show. Okay, um, the, I, I want to, to cover the, the 10 years. Uh, starting from 2011, and this is the wiki page for CGIR uh, announcing the formation of WLE. 2011 um, was perhaps an important uh, turning uh, year for a number of uh, paradigms that were developing at the time. And it coincided with FAO's flagship report on the state of world's land and water resources for food and agriculture, which uh, very nicely um, overlapped with, uh, with WLE's mandate and um, established a fertile ground to, uh, to see the relevance and the influence of uh, WLE on policy. If uh, we can link uh, global policy to uh, FAO and its partners such as IFAD uh, and their work with the member states and their partners. Um, 
the main messages from Solov at the time uh, were the following. Uh, the, the, the report was talking about increasing population and, uh, and demand from other sectors and putting pressure on natural resources and uh, making it challenging to feed the world. It also pointed out to the degradation of land and water resources systems and ecosystem deterioration at the time. Then it underlined the fact that a uh, majority of small scale producers were being bypassed and uh, were kept in a poverty trap. Uh, they were vulnerable uh, and land degradation and climatic uncertainty uh, had a negative impact on small scale producers. And then the governance systems have not kept up with the developments and they needed to be reformed. And uh, the, the report, uh, the flagship report from FAO indicated that agricultural output needed to increase to feed a growing population and it would come from intensification of production and it pointed out to the potential of expanding production uh, for food security and poverty elimination while limiting impacts on ecosystem services. So as you see, um, there is a great overlap with the mandate of WLE. So perfect opportunity for science to influence policy. And also the paradigm is, is only gradually changing because FAO is talking about limiting impacts on other ecosystem values or services rather than putting ecosystems in the objective function as equal peers to, uh, to development and uh, poverty alleviation and increasing production. Annual report of uh, WLE the following year and this is actually the first uh, year that WLE was able to show progress, indicated that uh, WLE was already on the right track, looking after uh, smallholder farmers uh, with a gender sensitivity and uh, looking at the specific conditions, whether it's rain fed in Africa, or improving irrigation and water management in Asia. It was also looking at uh, the equitable sharing of benefits with competition in mind and uh, had already uh, working, started working on sustainable intensification and proper investments to make this happen. And sustainable intensification is something that I would like to put a placeholder uh, because, um, because uh, this will be further developed by WLE and influence uh, the policy and make it work. The same year in 2012, uh, IVMI received the Stockholm Water Prize uh, and uh, Colin, the, the then director general in his uh, acceptance speech talked about sustainable intensification. Uh, this is also a personal uh, reflection for me because I was on the jury of the Stockholm Water Prize at the time uh, and a staff member of UNESCO and a UNESCO institution was also one of the candidates for the uh, for the prize. So uh, I was uh, also happy to see that uh, sustainable intensification was uh, taking uh, the front seat uh, for the prize. The same year, uh, the international community uh, met in Rio and, uh, and announced the common vision, the future we want uh, to the world. 
which included uh, a, a number of key elements that WAD had already started working on and would further develop. And one of these um, elements was, uh, was what FAO and its partners uh, were developing as common vision for food and agriculture, which came out in 2014. Uh, with a number of objectives, again, uh, very much relevant to uh, WLE's uh, mandate and would be impacted and informed in their actual uh, implementation as policy elements, which would then be uh, turned into uh, national policies. And again, sustainable intensification uh, was uh, among them a, a key element and um, at that time a 2015 paper by WLE uh, led by uh, Johan Rockstrom, the, the then chair of the Independent Steering Committee, uh, charted the way for sustainable intensification as defined, advocated and practiced by WLE and uh, this paper remains to be one of the most cited uh, papers when it comes to sustainable intensification of agriculture and certainly played a role in, uh, in further developing uh, the road to sustainable intensification in a broader context of ecosystem-based approaches to uh, to agriculture, uh, which uh, found its way to, for example, FAO and its partners uh, through agroecology and uh, ecosystem-based approaches, and with IFAD um, adopting uh, the same approach, uh, the, uh, the sustainable intensification as uh, advocated and developed uh, further uh, to inform policy uh, would become uh, more of a reality. Um, broadening the, uh, the scenery, uh, WLE had an impact on the sustainable development goals which were developed uh, during its midterm uh, in 2015, and WLE contributed to the scientific aspects, such as uh, helping uh, UN Water uh, through FAO in terms of incorporating environmental flows into water stress indicator. The water stress indicator did not have the environmental flows during the millennium development era, and I, I see this as a, a very important contribution. And here, uh, Vladimir Smaktin, who led the effort on behalf of WLE at the time, and here me uh, sitting at the launch of this report, uh, WLE's contributions to SDG 6 methodology uh, would continue uh, and another example is their uh, WLE's contribution to United Nations waters, uh, water use efficiency efforts in terms of methodology development and actually monitoring uh, SDG targets. Um, WLE and FAO uh, collaborated in looking at pollution from uh, from agricultural water management and this is another example of personal reflection uh, because Claudia and uh, myself uh, we launched the report uh, together in the Dushanbe conference one of the Dushanbe conferences at the time and uh, another uh, very solid example of WLE's impact on uh, on global policy was uh, was demonstrated when UN Water put put nature in center stage in 2018 and issued uh, the World Water Development Report with nature-based solutions for water, and Stefan Uhlenbrook was in the driving. 
uh, seed at the time on behalf of uh, UN Water and the definition of nature-based solutions, uh, the relationship between infrastructure and ecosystem services came from actually uh, WLE, a, a solid example of, uh, of again, um, informing uh, policies. I, I started with, um, with uh, SOLAV, a, the, the flagship report of FAO in 2011, and I would like to end with it. Uh, the, the SOLAV 2021 will be launched in about uh, 10 days time, nine days time. And uh, this report uh, will can, can show us how the paradigm has changed over a decade and uh, what WLE may have contributed to that change. And, uh, and WLE has been involved in more than one aspect of, of this flagship report, uh, again, including Stefan, among other scientists, uh, in terms of uh, writing, reviewing, and contributing to various parts of this report. And, uh, and the report shows the progress, such as integrated multi-sectoral approaches, uh, going from uh, sectoral solutions to integrated solutions, and underlines uh, the fact that agricultural research uh, has broadened the solution space in agriculture uh, underlined uh, the democratization through digital agriculture, but uh, warns against a, a digital divide that may not favor smallholder former, farmers. The fact that land and water governance is changing, but needs uh, to shift a gear to do this uh, further and in a more effective manner. And investment opportunities should be further uh, developed and tapped with the new uh, developments. And farmers should be recognized not as beneficiaries of some sort of assistance, but as prime investors. All of the things that WLE um, has endeavored. Uh, in its programs and projects to, uh, to materialize. Uh, but key issues remain to address. Uh, not that uh, WLE uh, has not done a good job, but things do take to change uh, over a decade. And we are hoping that um, with policies and uh, scientific information being on the right track, uh, many of these can be handled properly. And uh, 10 years later, uh, on top of our priorities, there is climate change and its impact on land degradation uh, and uh, intensification of agriculture. Uh, and in terms of floods and, and droughts and its impacts, again, on agriculture. Again, uh, the, the polarization of farming systems um, to the disadvantage of uh, smallholder farmers uh, comes as a warning after a decade that will need to be uh, taken care of uh, and addressed in further developments. Water scarcity remains an issue, and the, the pressures uh, emanating from, uh, from competition will continue. I will close with a report uh, that was launched yesterday uh, by Water Police Group, of which I am a member, uh, which identified the, the policy priorities and challenges of global water leaders, such as water ministers and heads of water organizations, and the risks, uh, risk perception of water leaders um, is definitely showing the, the direction of climate change, competition, and then droughts and floods uh, 
linked to uh, to climate change also so these are some of the things that will continue to uh, to be challenges over the uh, upcoming decade and years with this i would like to end my uh, presentation and uh, come back to my Zoom room and thank you, thank you, thank you WLE, for your service to the community and for uh, asking me to share with you my perspectives. Thank you, Professor Humber, for this excellent presentation. And now, now let's put the video that we just saw on WLE Solutions and the keynote presentation of Professor Umber into perspectives. So for this, I want now to invite uh, Dr. Stefan Allenbrook, Program Director of WLE, and Mrs. Yvonne Tamba, young scientist working at the soil steam of ICRAF. Both Dr. Allenbrook and Mrs. Tamba are going to join right now Professor Umber in a live dialogue about future challenges for research on water, land, and ecosystems. So it's an open format, no prescribed questions. Let's listen to your personal reflections. So Dr. Stefan, please kick off the conversation. Thank you, Marcella. Oja, uh, Professor Unwa, this was just excellent. So thank you so much. We, we all enjoyed it. I think that would be a moment where we probably in, an, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, theater would all stand up and clap our hands. So sorry that you can't see that. Um, but after having two renowned uh, personalities just uh, giving the opening remarks and a keynote speech, I, I think it's really time now to, to hand over to the next generation. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to see Yvonne here, Miss Yvonne uh, Tamba. Uh, Yvonne is a, a PhD student still. She has been working for WE since some time. She will explain in a minute, I hope. And um, instead of me introducing you for, for longer, Yvonne, over to you. Can you just tell us a little bit more about your involvement in WLE and how WLE has supported you as a young scientist in your career? Yeah, um, thank you, Stefan, for the invitation. And um, thank you as well to Professor Olze. That was a very enlightening and fascinating um, introduction to the history of WLE and how we've gotten to where we are today. And for me, it's particularly interesting to hear about because um, for the past few years, I've been very fortunate to work with some of the communities that have been impacted by WLE's work. So I've been on the ground and this has been really supported by WLE. Of course, um, I've been based at the ECRAF HQ in Nairobi, working with uh, Dr. Keith Shepard and most recently with uh, Dr. Lee Winowicki. And, and, uh, um, and with WLE, we've been working to develop an impact evaluation tool that supports holistic decision making across agricultural landscapes and even further. And we've been very lucky to um, work with under the umbrella of uh, Flagship 5 and Flagship 1. And this has really served to put us on the ground, not just myself, but my team of also young future scientists plus myself. It's really helped to put us on the ground and to really engage with um, the people who are in need and the vulnerable communities that are in need of the technologies and the innovations that are um, being brought up. Thank you, Stefan. No, oh, thank you. This is very interesting. But um, after having having seen the short video, of, of course, you have been involved in the program for some years, and and the highlights video, which tried to summarize 200 plus projects in five minutes, which which is a challenge. Um, and having, having listened to the excellent speech by Professor Unver, you know, what are your reflections? What would be your highlights, you know, or is there anything particularly that you feel that stands out or something that, that, sh that you felt should have get a bit more attention? Yeah, um, yes, uh, again, it's, it's hard to summarize all of that in such a short time. So, but I do think it presents a really good um, introduction to everything that has been done and also what can be done in the future. Um, personally, I think the main successes have been the impact on the people and livelihoods and landscapes. Um, restoring degraded landscapes is obviously important now as we are feeling more and more the effects of climate change. And I think um, speaking on, on behalf of the youth and the people who are going to have to take um, over management of these landscapes, it's good to know that the science is there and the science has been done and um, moving forward, especially because of the impact of being on the global south where I'm from and where um, I've been 
my whole life. So um, this is the places that have been very severely affected and will continue to be very severely affected. And I think what is most relevant and what I have found in the past few years to be most relevant is the link between science and policy. And um, drawing from Professor Obe's um, presentation, this link where we see how science can be made accessible and relevant to policymakers, that I think is a very, uh, very relevant to us now and even as we move forward. And um, I think what I would really like to hear more about is the partnerships that have, you know, really come about because of WLE's work the past 10 years. Um, at the institutional level, their working relationships at a personal level. And um, I think this also brings me to a question that I have to both of you panelists here right now, which is um, given your history with WLE and with a lot of the other organizations you've been working with and all the relationships that you've brought up, um, I'm sure you've seen there's been quite a lot of rapid change over those years. So if, if reflecting on those, how do you think, based on the past, we could move forward into achieving the goals of the future? Ojai, you want to go first? It's a difficult question, so I, I leave to the professor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the WLE had a, a very smart combination of things. Uh, WLE uh, was able to, to integrate across sectors and um, represented a number of organizations uh, coordinated and, and led by IMI. And, uh, and this smart uh, combination and, and the formulation of, uh, of its steering and, and monitoring and evaluation uh, made it uh, quite possible uh, to, on the one hand, to actually do things that touched uh, people's lives in a lasting manner and not um, for the lifetime of a project, which I think is very important when it comes to, uh, to external entities, including uh, research for development, as well as um, other uh, assistance-based uh, uh, um, partners such as uh, you know international overseas development assistance um, for to make lasting impacts and I think the, the smart formulation allowed this to happen uh, it could have happened more extensively uh, with uh, obviously uh, more funding uh, and, and resources is always uh, an issue and will remain to be issue. But the key is to make the best use of existing resources and have the resources trigger lasting change and, um, and keep the change uh, dynamic and adapt to the uh, circumstances uh, as exhibited now uh, with uh, adaptation, further adaptation efforts to climate change on the part of smallholder farmers on the one hand and, uh, and bringing in innovations such as affordable technologies that are now being taken up by many others, uh, including uh, the farmers' organizations and definitely national governments themselves. Uh, so th this is a demonstration of uh, policy research for development uh, going hand in hand and uh, and contributing to a, a positive change. Mm. Stefan, back to I, you. I think this was a very comprehensive answer and, and um, the little I could add to that is probably uh, the WLE had this systems approach and looking at water, land and ecosystems, which is very challenging. But it's, it's not necessarily by studying only one aspect, no, but I think the program really from, from its start, you know, realized that the, the interdependencies of these systems very much in a food systems context as well. So how, how, how do we understand the, the interdependencies between water, land and ecosystems and the food systems and the people and the policies that, that need to be made? I think that that was the ambition and, and there were quite a number of very good examples that colleagues were able to to, um, to understand systems interdependencies better, to advise and to co-develop and co-create policies and innovations that, that make a difference. I, I think that that is the exciting part of it. But um, if, if, I, if I may bounce it back to you, Yvonne, you know, and 
uh, sorry for putting you again into that that youth uh, um, uh, corner, not corner. I'm, uh, um, you are the youth representative today. So, but you know what I found very uh, interesting. If you look at the, the global climate action movement, there has been a lot of attention to the youth. At, at least they they you know they they demanded attention. There was this uh, triggered by Greta Thunberg. The, this school strike and my, my kids were busy with that and 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 many children around the world that even younger generations now but but also the youth and the young scientists have been quite prominent in the, the climate discussions um also at cop 26 um but what's your take you know if, if we go beyond climate change is the voice of the youth is that heard enough if we talk about uh, the, the voice about uh, of the youth when it's about water land and ecosystems in that changing climate in that change and challenges related to the food and nutrition security. Do, do we listen enough to you or is, is, there, is there key aspects that are overlooked from, from your perspective? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> I need to wipe this hat, but uh, I think the youth demand to be had, as you said, and obviously we've had very many um, capable and very loud youth leaders who've come up and who have made sure that what we are seeing is being um, had and felt. Um, um, when it comes to the main concerns among the youth, I would say that food, um, food security and nutrition security is a main concern actually moving forward because we know that with the climate is changing, we're going to have um, we're going to have to do more. We're going to have to achieve a lot more with much fewer resources moving forward. And I think even this past two years have been quite the shock to everybody with COVID. We've seen that even the supply chains that were supposed to be making sure that the people who could get food were getting food were broken down and the knock-on effects of that has been devastating for so many communities. So moving forward, I think we see that um, the effects of even beyond COVID uh, and climate change, the effects of just our day-to-day -day lives are very, that we're very perceptible to the public now. And I think speaking for the youth, we're all just aware that moving forward, a lot has to be changed and possibly in a very short amount of time. And it is shocking to know that we have not yet built this resilience, that the work that we've been doing has not been enough. And there's still so much more that we could do and we should do. But that's why then it's important for a forum such as this, where we talk about the solutions and we talk about um, how the solutions can be practical for small scale farmers, for the marginalized. Um, and I think I would also like to echo um, Professor Oge when he talked about adaptation, because um, I would say that that is where the gap is when it comes to water, land and ecosystem. We've talked about mitigation and we have been talking about mitigation, but moving forward for agricultural landscapes, for natural landscapes, we might want to look more about how to reduce vulnerabilities and how to improve resilience and come up with a um, would call it say science for adaptation. Yeah. Um, maybe I could also uh, pose the same question to Professor Oge. Um, what would you say or what do you think we could be done to address the inclusion of youth in the policy space in the yeah, research? Yes. Uh the question is a valid one. I don't know the answer, but I know that th this has not yet been addressed adequately. The youth are uh, both informed and angry, and that is a good combination. Being uninformed and angry is, is, not, is not good. But this we are seeing, particularly in the case of uh, climate change, the, the, the youth are expecting the policymakers, the politicians, to to really make a change rather than uh, rhetoric and and sort of spreading uh, solutions to time. They they want a change and they want the change now. And and I think the the policymakers, the politicians, and others that have something to do uh, regarding this should address the inclusion of youth. A, a lot more effectively into their uh, 
policy and decision making processes rather than uh, only uh, communicating with them, establishing dialogue channels. The youth should be incorporated in these processes actively. No, I, I fully you. agree. That's nothing to add. The last sentence was just uh, exactly what we need to do. Over to Marcella again, and big thank you to Professor Unver and uh, Yvonne. This was excellent, Yvonne. Thank you so much. Over. No, thank you. Thank you for this. And let's, let's keep uh, this reflection mode. So for this, I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Twyler. She's board chair of the WLE Independent Steering Committee and former director general of Biodiversity International. Dr. Twyler will guide the next high level panel who will offer their views on key elements to build on WLE legacy. So over to you, Dr. Twyler. And also before you go ahead, I just want to remind everyone who is connected that this uh, symposium is being recorded. So you will be able to see this again afterwards. So over to you, Dr. Toyer. Thank you very much, Marcella. And uh, thanks to Stefan and other WLE colleagues for putting this wonderful uh, seminar together. I, I did want to say, I think it's really wonderful that um, WLE is doing this. We had a great uh, internal conversation a couple of weeks ago about um, sort of lessons learned from WLE. And I think this um, goes further in helping to understand what WLE has achieved. And as we were just discussing where the, the gaps are in, in future uh, for the research that the 1CG needs to be uh, embracing going forward. And I think that's a lot of what may come out of this, this particular, particular session. Um, and as, um, as Dr. Unruh said, I, th I think his wonderful presentation, um, oh, yeah, I lost my entire screen again. Um, his wonderful presentation has um, given us good highlights of what the CG um, and WLE has achieved in its, its short tenure with very, very limited funding. So um, I would like to um, first introduce uh, uh, His Excellency Dr. Uh, Seleshi Bakeli, who is the Chief Negotiator and Advisor on Transboundary Rivers and GERD, uh, and former Minister of Water, Irrigation and Energy from Ethiopia. So um, if I can ask the first question, um, Dr. Bekele. So I, I think WLE has done a great deal of research in Ethiopia over the past 10 years, uh, everything from land degradation, water management, irrigation development, accelerating um, rural energy access uh, and strengthening women's inclusion. And from your country's perspective, which of WLE's achievements in Ethiopia have you found to be particularly useful? Thanks and over to you. You are you are. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good, morning. good afternoon, good afternoon. wherever you are, and uh, nice to see some of my former colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to really reflect uh, on the water, land, and ecosystem program. Uh, it is, uh, as it is said, uh, it is about uh, people, it's about policy, planet, and partnership. Very well uh, speaks to the sustainable development goals. Uh, in Ethiopia, it has helped us to really look into how to rehabilitate natural resource base uh, and also increase production and productivity on the land we have by managing uh, both water and the land and uh, other inputs. And uh, the program also helped us in uh, looking at uh, policy and strategic issues. The research results uh, migrated to influencing policy and decision-making. So it has been very instrumental. 
the waterland and ecosystem it is is about uh, food production mainly uh, looking into crop and livestock uh, agroforestry system so uh, if i mention some of the examples from the time i have um, looked at it uh, one is looking at the research to policy impact we can uh, really pick uh, for example the need for agricultural technologies machineries and equipment uh, this has went on to the extent of influencing tax exemption because uh, irrigation became the top priority for the country in terms of food security uh, and uh, really overcome the challenge of uh, population growth and uh, related uh, insufficiency of production. So equipment and the machinery uh, are tax exempted. This is direct and significant uh, influence. And uh, because you have observed that um, low productivity in a subsistence type of farming must be transformed uh, to consolidating the land and also having uh, the scale. And uh, not only one rain fed production, but two, three productions are very important. So it influenced the, uh, the production system itself. So the research work from uh, Amy went into Africa agricultural transformation agency agencies through that then came to the ministries of uh, ministry of finance minister of irrigation minister of agriculture to uh, decide on this the other good example i will uh, mention from waterland ecosystem is uh, uh, exclosure research that means uh, delineating different river basins and also uh, excluding <laughs> highly degraded areas out of uh, production or out of use, and so that this uh, highly degraded system will uh, regenerate itself. Uh, of course, as you may know, Ethiopia has embarked also on a huge afforestation and reforestation program, annually planting 5 billion plus uh, trees. We have reached in three years 18 billion uh, trees. Uh, it all interlinked, you know, from the exclosure system. We have seen that uh, the regeneration of the ecosystem and uh, better hydrology and ecosystem functioning. Um, and uh, within that, livelihood diversification is uh, very obvious. Uh, beekeeping, cut and carry system, agroforestry like uh, fruit production, etc. While this marginal land in the past was not uh, providing any benefit except uh, for livestock rearing, which is uh, not also adequate. So the carrying capacity, etc., has increased because of the carry, uh, cut and carry system. Uh, the third example I would mention is the irrigated area mapping uh, in different river basins. Uh, in certain reporting mechanism, the irrigated area were overreported in the past, but uh, using remote sensing and high resolution information system and the uh, ground truthing, I think we have uh, a good result, a good output that could uh, influence again decision making in uh, where to do irrigation, in which uh, river basin, and uh, in what region of Ethiopia. Uh, finally, as um, uh, Nile Basin Irrigation Policy Framework has also brought out a uh, very useful recommendation uh, on issues of intensification of uh, rainfall, rain-fed agriculture, uh, issues related to improved water use efficiency, uh, improving uh, uh, cropping pattern uh, on different agroecologies, also analyzing water deficit uh, irrigation or deficit irrigation technologies, uh, water supply management, and using different water application uh, technologies uh, were very helpful. So uh, the recommendation those came out 
uh, are also usable in the Nile Basin. So as uh, looking forward, I think uh, uh, we have to look into new areas uh, as well. For example, the area I mentioned to you, for example, in the Green Legacy uh, initiative of the Prime Minister, where we are trying to do a lot of planting. So uh, lots of effort uh, went in, but also together with that 12, 13 million people uh, of 30 days labor are freely contributing. So the impact of that on soil and water conservation, on um, food production, um, the erosion reduction must be uh, analyzed. Uh, for those which are already in place, exposed type of analysis, but also for uh, uh, newly forthcoming, I think ex ante type uh, research will be very useful. Uh, also, since this water, land, and ecosystem touched into many of the SDGs, if it could be helped to track how far we have progressed in SDGs, uh, with this context is also important. My dimension of nexus, uh, not only water, land, and ecosystem, but also relate to energy and uh, climate change would also be uh, useful because since the research is ongoing or and most probably after the legacy with uh, a new form as uh, cross-cutting CGR research might come. So uh, this kind of ideas are uh, very important. So thank you very much. Let me go to you. Um... Dr. Sweenan, um, I think it's been interesting having to have your comments after Dr. Bekele's, um when he's been talking about the policy changes and shifts that Ethiopia has made as a result of WLE's work. You are the new leader of the um, uh, director of the Sy Systems Transformation, one of the new uh, CGR science groups. And I think the efforts that you're leading are one of the most important uh, in terms of the, the research that the CG is going to be doing and that it really will be incorporating this um, systems approach, which is taking into account not just um, economic indicators, but also looking at uh, the issues around climate, around waterland, ecosystems, biodiversity, etc. So if you could um, give for us some, and I know you're new to the CG, but maybe reflect a little bit on uh, the highlights from the WLE program. IFPRI has been a huge contributor to that program. And if you can tell us how and uh, how you see WLE's research impacting the new CG, one CG uh, research program. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Anne. <clears throat> can you hear me? I, I can hear you, yes. Okay, good. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, it's uh, thanks also to the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, it's an honor to be on this panel. It's also very interesting for me because I'm learning a lot of uh, things here. I think the, the historical overview that was given uh, by Professor Uno was was I think fantastic. I mean, give a, a great uh, perspective on on where we come from and where we are going. Well, I think the, the impact of, of WLE on the new research strategy or the new 1CGIR, if you want, is quite fundamental. I mean, if you just look at, so we are going to be organized now in three major science groups or action areas. And so one of them is called, <clears throat> the one I'm leading is called systems transformation. And it's explicitly systems transformation, not agricultural systems transformation. It is food, land and water systems transformation. So there already, I think it's a very important uh, legacy in this uh, going forward. Second one, if you look at the organization of our uh, structure, we will have four, they're called units for the moment, they might maybe called divisions or, or pillars or something later, but really the units are, one is on food and nutrition policy, one is on land and environment, one is titled water systems, and the fourth is on transformation strategy, which incorporates again, these different uh, aspects of the, the, the full food, land and water system. So three or the four units of the, of the overall structure are explicitly integrating uh, work or legacies, if you want, and people coming out of the WLE program. Uh, clearly in the research strategy, the, I think the legacy is very clear. <clears throat> we also see it, and then let me give you 
few examples of that, but I also want to say also the, and it's not just in the content, but also in the leadership, I think, if you see several of the people who played an important role in WLE will play, take on an important leadership role in the, uh, the new strategy and the implementation of the new strategy. I think as most people on this call know, the implementation is, is taking place right now through uh, the development of a, a series of initiatives. We will have 33, which are large research programs, and 12 of them are um, in the systems transformation group. And there are six regionally integrated initiatives where also several of the people from uh, our systems transformation group are very active. And so there are several of these initiatives actually co-led for by people who uh, were important in the leadership of WLE. There's one project called Nexus Gains. Um, I still have trouble with the title because it doesn't say, but they're really gonna work on the interaction of environment, land, water, uh, biodiversity uh, systems there. And that's uh, co-led actually by two people on the panel here today, by Stefan Ullenbroek and Claudia Ringler, so they can uh, maybe explain more on this. We have a, a full initiative on agroecology, which is led by Marcella, our master of ceremony of today. And then in addition, several of our climate change, uh, climate, uh, the initiatives focusing on climate change are uh, where there's a very strong in influence of, of, of the researchers, but also building on previous WLE's work, for example, on soil carbon sequestration, on flood and, and drought uh, management, etc. So I can go on. And so even in the initiatives where they don't take the goal lead, I mean, the, the, the emphasis on the much more systems approach, including water and environment is uh, land and environment is very prominently. Maybe do you do, uh, <clears throat> let me give you an illustration how I see going forward in the future, why this is really important. Okay. And so if uh, the, I was, I participated actively on, on in the food system summit and on COP26, I was there. Uh, and if I look at my own institute, uh, IFPRI, we were very prominent in the Food Systems Summit. I think we did several studies, background studies for the Science Committee. We had a whole blog series on it. We were involved in the action tracks. We, uh, we took leaderships and, and, and the gender lever, the finance lever, etc. And so I think it's very satisfactory. The story on COP is very different, okay? Uh, IFPRI was not very prominently there. Uh, the, uh, there was more, I mean, IMI, for example, the Alliance were there uh, on a more prominent basis, <clears throat> but still, okay, I think the future is really have a much more integrated approach that the WLE vision, the, the work that they're doing, and also the people of it should really be integrated much stronger within the overall CDR strategy, and that the combination of this uh, could really have a much more prominent impact in the future. If you look back, I mean, it's, it's not just every, I think agriculture and food issues were really not given the place or did not manage to get the, the place they deserve, I think, in, in the climate debate at the COP, and we have to do much better on that. And I'm actually, this is a huge challenge. I think it's also huge opportunities for us to come together. And by integrating these different powers, the capacities that we have, the skills of people now in the different centers. And I think systems transformation is, is, has a huge role to play. It has huge opportunities. So I'm very optimistic about that, actually. Um, let me leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. And I'll, I'll come back and ask um, a, a second round of questions if we have time. I think maybe just if you can think about this, you know, there's COSI Commission, that, and we'll hear from Ruben in a minute about that, um, really demonstrated how much of the research that we have, um, public sector research, private, uh, is going towards crops. And this has been the CG heartland, right, for years. And I think what we're seeing now is a is a shift towards this more systems approach, but but there is still an, a DNA <laughs> within the CG of, of that focus on, on individual crops. If you can reflect, think a little bit about that question, how we change and shift the DNA of the, the CG community towards um, working on these more systemic and, and challenge, more challenging issues, that would be great. So, um, but I'll come back to you um, in a second on that, thanks. So um, very appropriate, I want now to go to um, Dr. Claudia Ringler, who has, uh, is now the WLE Deputy uh, Program Director and uh, a member of your staff at IFPRI. Um, so Claudia, if I can turn to you. You've been involved in WLE for the, its entire history uh, in various roles as a researcher, flagship co-lead, 
and now as deputy director in its last year. So from your perspective, what are the highlights of um, the work that WLE has done and what do you consider to be its main achievements? And I think if you could particularly um, reflect on the gender work that WLE has done, which has been uh, quite important, um, that would be great. So Claudia, over to you. Sure, thanks. thanks very much. And also thanks to you, of course, for stressing the importance of natural resource management in our economics profession. Um, as he said, that if we, we always have an uphill battle and it's very different at WLE where, you know, we're just part of a uh, integrated program. Yeah, so as Anne said at the beginning, we've had this two half day workshops to celebrate some of the key achievements of the WLE program. And I unfortunately don't talk fast enough to fit all of those highlights into two minutes, but we do have a, a large set of very short um, synthesis and legacy briefs, about 30 of them. So please feel free to explore and I hope someone can put the links uh, to these briefs into the chat box. So, but you know, what did uh, stuck with me are at least two things as, as like the highlight of the highlights maybe. So one thing is, I think that WLE throughout these 10 year period has kind of held up the flag and was the only CGR research program that focused on the essentiality of ecosystem health for agriculture and food systems. And um, so this really has been critical. I think now with food systems transformation, with the uh, better understanding of the climate crisis. I think there is a growing understanding of this essentiality, but there's still obviously a lot of work needs to be done of how we can achieve our uh, food system SDG2 uh, goals while preserving and improving ecosystem health. So I think definitely WLE has, um, you know, the research it has done has a very strong future a set of impacts yet to come and also has to continue into the future in, in these one CGR initiatives. And I think we've, uh, while climate change is an important research area that we have done a lot of work on, I think WE went a lot further also identifying important trade-offs across mm. environmental objectives. For example, water depletion when diesel pumps are being replaced or were replaced with solar technologies. Those are good for emissions reductions and you know celebrated by the climate change, climate mitigation world, but they are often very bad for water and aquatic environments. So we can't just push out these technologies without uh, also considering um, institutions to go along with them. So those I think are some of the key achievements. And of course, as Anne said, we've also I think done a lot of work on inclusion, improving um, equity and, and also trying to see how we can um, better reach marginal groups, the role of social identity in, uh, for example, accessing wash services in Nepal, I think was just one piece of work. Um, other work on gender is like, how can we ensure um, inclusion and women's voices for wetland management in Myanmar. We've, I think, also done the most uh, extensive work ever on how to uh, strengthen women's empowerment in water governance, water management and irrigation uh, systems. There's another uh, nice synthesis piece out there. And finally, I'd say, yeah, we have also worked on uh, strengthening inclusion um, of women and overall women's voices in, in flood risk um, index insurance. So there has been some work on flood insurance and uh, equity before, but then, yeah, no one had looked at, at the flood risk situation where women's voices are also traditionally mm -hmm. included. So yes, I think we, we can also celebrate our, um, our achievements in that area. Thank you, back, back to you, Anne. Thanks, thanks, Claudia. And, and another question I want to come back to is this one that that you mentioned and uh, Yo mentioned, and uh, Dr. Uh, Seleshi also mentioned about looking at trade-offs and synergies across different different um, policy choices, different um, different investment activities that that governments are making, um, and in particular how we link in the energy climate piece. Um, which is part of how, how we look at these trade-offs. So, um, so if I can turn to um, Dr. Dan Walker, 
who is the CEO of um, ACIIR, which has been one of the major donors uh, to the WLE program. And thank you, Dr. Walker. I know it's quite late for you in Australia now, and we really appreciate your um, participating and being part of this, uh, this webinar. So as one of the key donors, um, and for which we are all very grateful, um, can, you, can you really tell us, do you, um, how do you see this investment? that uh, the Australian government has made in uh, in WLE? And are there any specific um, res uh, results that have come from WLE's work that has informed ACIR's um, uh, investment strategy with um, other donors or to the uh, development of the 1CG uh, resource por portfolio? So thanks and over to you, Dr. Walker. Thanks very much. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so for, for me, I think the distinctive feature of WLE has been its, its starting premise that agricultural landscapes um, can and should be productive ecosystems. Um, so from an Australian point of view, you know, we have generally unreliable water resources, fairly poor soils, fairly fragile ecosystems. So yeah. Australian agriculture deals on a sort of daily basis with the sustainability challenge. Um, and so our agriculture innovation system is also heavily engaged with and challenged by this um, imperative to balance productivity and profitability with system resilience and, and sustaining the resource base. And, and of course, now with the sort of force multiplier of greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and climate change. So the reason I say all that is that the, you know, the WLE, WLE agenda really resonates with us. Um, in terms, obviously, of the CG mandate, there's no need for this audience to talk about the imperatives for um, growing more food and reducing poverty and feeding people healthier food, but with the context of seeking to use less water, less land, few, less energy, fewer nutrients per new unit output. Um, so that's a sort of given in this context. But, but I think it is worth reflecting on how much harder it is to actively address that challenge uh, in addition to, to simply further defining that problem, those complexities, that, that nexus challenge. Um, so, so my sense is that uh, WLE has made a really valuable contribution towards actively affecting um, that transformation in, in various landscapes and being able to scale that experience um, across geographies, ac across a very wide geography. Um, so it's been affecting it both sort of physically and in terms of attitudes and, and policies. So um, beyond simply advocating for uh, a very active um, sort of co-design approach. Um, so in, in the interest of time, there's, there's a whole lot of sort of things that stand out for me from the WLE portfolio, and actually Claudia mentioned several of them just now. Um, but, but I think that emphasis on, on the interdependence between agriculture and environment, in particular in the context of intensification, stands out. Um, so in, in some very specific cases, this concept of multifunctional landscapes, so, so we were heavily involved with WLE on rice fish systems in Myanmar, and, and really bringing those two... two um, uh, elements of production together in terms of investigation and development opens up a series of opportunities that, that wouldn't have existed without that multifunctional perspective. Uh, and there's nice work there on, on, I think, Matthew McCarthy's work on wetlands in, as reservoirs for fish to improve productivity. Again, uh, this close connection between ecosystems and, and productivity. Um, uh, Claude has already mentioned the, the work on groundwater governance, which is a you know, significant interest to us and, and the challenges with, with solar pumping. Um, and also touched very much on, on a lot of the work in, in gender, which uh, I think has really stood, stands out and, and um, uh, is, is something I hope is very much sustained into the future. So, so your question was, is this, is this a good investment? I think my view would be uh, that all the evidence is very, very promising, but it's probably too early to tell. And, and um, maybe we could talk again in, in 2031 to see how the, <laughs> how the legacy from WALE has flowed through both to transformation on the ground and, and in, and in uh, you know, national and regional policy systems in, in private sector investment, but also in, in the, um, the work of the CG going forward. And so, uh, you know, very, very briefly, uh, I really hope that there's a, a continued very diverse geography uh, for the CG, uh, you know, from a, an Australian parochial perspective, we really hope there's a strong presence in Southeast Asia and South Asia as well as the completely understandable strong focus in, in sub-Saharan Africa and on some of those um, uh, you know, uh, 
very diverse landscape. So I really like the idea of the mega deltas work, for example, as being a, a forum for taking forward some of what WLE has, has pioneered in the last decade. So in the interest of time, that's probably it for me for the moment. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Walker. I, I think one of the interesting points for me, in addition to what you have just outlined, is you know Australia invested in this in this program because Australia itself is facing a number of these challenges. And while we think of the CG research programs as being you know devoted to um, issues in developing countries, I, I suspect there's a lot that some developed countries could learn from some of the research that's that's been going on and some of the solutions that have been developed by uh, the CG research program. So um, something to, to reflect on. And if we have time, I'll come back to you on that. Um, so if I can turn now to uh, Dr. Malu Ndavi, who is the lead technical specialist uh, for research and impact assessment at uh, IFAD. So uh, good to see you, Malu, Malu again. Um, it's been a while. So. Uh, WLE and its beneficiaries are grateful for EFOD's continuing support um, by participating, uh, by the participation of Joe Puri as a member of the Independent Steering Committee. And I think the collaboration of uh, the Rome based agencies with the CG system has been really terrific. But um, I want to um, talk with you about the implementation of scaling and scaling of uh, the research for development results that the CG uh, has really been putting a lot of energy into um, over the past few years. So if you could provide us with your perspective and focus on the investment in rural people and how uh, IFAD is able to use the research results from WLE uh, to achieve its own mission. Thanks, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tatwila. It's been a long time since we met in Mexico. Now, I will start by saying three, three, three issues, or three or four. I hope you can hear me. One, scientists like talking to themselves and up the rest of us who don't know a lot of science. The second thing, which is important from a development perspective, and we appreciate is the fact that research is supposed to de de deliver global public goods. But from development perspective, global pu public goods must be converted to private goods for use by the smallholder farmer under, under their control. The third one, which is very important to me, given my role, is the fact that science never fails. It is the delivery that fails. Now, regarding your question, how can IFAD utilize this? Actually, it's just one sentence, and I'll expand it a little bit. It is through engagement at country level, through partnerships with the program management department, because this is the department that has the mandate to develop, to invest at country level. And this department is the one that proposes specific in interventions, and therefore they would require the technologies, the innovations that WLE has, has achieved. Let me say this. When I listen to the presentation of Professor Umwa, it was very clear what has been achieved. But then let me bring, bring simplicity into this complexity of scientists. There's a project that I was managing, implemented by WLE in West Africa, in the Sahel. That program came to an end. And while, and there are very specific outputs, which when I summarized, I was very proud of. The first one was the question of the management of agricultural water, uh, agricultural, agricultural water management tools in which the tools were specifically developed for non-technical users, including development practitioners, policy makers, investors. And I looked at our portfolio, especially in Burkina Faso, what we were investing in, and I looked at the, what, the technologies which were there. And I said, there was a complete fit. But I just want to ask myself, were these available to the National Agricultural Systems or to the country director for IFAD? 
And that is why I say the science doesn't fail, it is the delivery. The second one is they came up with a very good improved practices for livestock grazing, management of, of pastures, fantastic outputs. How you can rotate, uh, how, for example, the, the, the question of the, the management of the grasslands. Then the third was, was actually, which I was to me was the most important, is the management of the small reservoirs. Burkina Faso has got so many of them, and they came up with very good opportunities and methods of how to do it. The fourth one was the question of solar irrigation, and someone has just men, uh, talked about it rega regarding the use of uh, diesel power and pumps. These are all there. Then the last one, and the most important one is, which is important to me, is the fact that if it has been tried to invest in Botswana, and the Botswana at one time did request support, and the idea was to look at the resource recovery and reuse. You did a lot of work on that. Those technologies are available, but I don't, I don't know that they are accessible. So I would say in a nutshell, yes, we can use all these technology innovations and the outputs of WLE, no question about it. But I dare ask, where are they? How do we access them? Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Malo. I think what you've said is really, really important. And I think it's also important to note that under its new structure, the CG has appointed um, uh, one of the DGs um, specifically, um, Juan Lucas Restrepo, my replacement at, at Biodiversity, to really focus on these partnerships with um, international agencies, but most importantly with national governments to make sure that those linkages that you just talked about and those connections that you just talked about are, are really made and engaged because I think it's, it has been a challenge for the CG over the last few years to, to really make sure that the work that, that we have done gets um, disseminated and known about uh, by international investment agencies like IFAD and, and national governments. So if I can turn now to Ruben Echeverria, who is uh, the chair of COSAI, the Commission on Sustainable Ag Intensification, and uh, the former director general of SEAT, and so my partner in crime when we started uh, merging SEAT and Biodiversity. So Ruben has also recently become a senior advisor to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, so is in a position to um, make a, connect a lot of dots. So Ruben, you have been supporting uh, the WLE program in a lot of different ways as former director general of SEAT, who's one of the key partners for WLE and in the last year and a half as chair of the Commission on Sustainable Ag Intensification. So if you could reflect a bit on what are the key achievements of um, COSI that has built on the research results of WLE and other CRPs and, and any lessons for the CG from the work that COSI has done. So thanks, over to you, Ruben. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Greetings from Washington, DC. And um, I, I feel that uh, being the chair of the commission that uh, WLE started, I feel part of the family. And uh, so thanks for this in invite. I also think that uh, listening to all of these presentations that we in the research community don't, are always running this marathon of doing great science, fundraising, implementing projects, being in Zoom meetings, but we'll have uh, enough time to stop a bit and reflect and celebrate. So I, I see this uh, event today as a more a celebration of us uh, fantastic success of uh, one of the key CGR programs. So uh, just to follow up, uh, uh, to answer your question, of course, and to follow up on, on, on my friend Malu, I think it's very clear that the development finance has a very clear role in, in play to, to play in this delivering impacts, uh, basically translating research outputs to development outcomes. So he says science, doesn't fail, we sometimes fail in delivery. Well, this is what I call translation of outputs to development outcomes. So the commission, COSAI has un uncovered evidence to ensure that there is much better understanding of the investment landscape for innovation. 
This is, I think, the first legacy from, from the Commission. Of the $60 billion currently spent on innovation in the Global South, by far the largest investors are national governments and the private sector. Surprise. So this means that if, if we are to really have sustainable impact, we must be working together a lot with governments and the private sector, plus hopefully global funders, to ensure that they are collectively playing the most efficient role in generating these uh, solutions and delivering innovation. As we consider this portfolio of investment, uh, I think we need to realize one of the findings from the commission and is that only 7%, 7% of all of that $60 billion of innovation investment explicitly targets environmental objectives. So there is a lot of investment in so-called sustainable agricultural systems, sustainable innovation, but particularly on environmental, not much. And only half of that, 4% or less, uh, targets social, social objectives. So as we work to scale up the investment portfolio, we must also work to ensure that, in, that, that this investment portfolio is balanced <coughs> in, a, in, a, in a smarter way. So, so our efforts should focus on environmental and social challenges. And I think that's a, a great second legacy of the commission. When we commission a study, uh, the commission uh, uh, hired a, a, a great research institute based here in Washington to, to study the investment gap. How to reach SDG2? We identified the gap at about $15 billion. As a bare minimum, investment portfolio needed to contribute to research, scaling climate smart solutions and improve water management. So the third legacy of the of, uh, WLE through this commission is an identified focus on water management, making up about a quarter of this $15 billion investment gap. So if you really have all of these billions and you want to invest to reach SDG2, think investing in the solutions that WLE and others have uh, provided on water management. So the analysis shows that the portfolio of investors in different regions is very different, of course. Private sector will drive hopefully the transformation in Asia, but international research, CGR and others will, will continue to work hopefully in Africa. Uh, now we have also seen, and Joe, Joe Swainen just mentioned that, uh, that we have seen this year this Food Summit and COP as a huge challenge to translate to action all of these solutions. So we shouldn't be all only providing solutions and then looking for problems. I think this is, translation is a key, key item for the CGR to keep translating this research into outcomes. So the commission, part of the legacy, uh, very modest legacy, we have developed three tools to support this innovation. Uh, uh, we have evaluated a kit of instruments that can ensure effective use and impact of innovation. <laughs> We have looked at key success factors that enable innovation to move through pathways, the famous pathways to scale. And finally, we have uh, developed or are working on principles and metrics to guide innovation in sustainable agri-food systems. So this is what I consider the fourth legacy tools that investors can really use to measure progress. Our fifth and final legacy is the initial work that the commission has done on payment for ecosystem services. Mm. Something that uh, started as everybody knows about 20 years ago and it's been put aside. Well, this is this for a small scale agri-food systems, uh, this is key. And there's a lot going on on payment for ecosystem services that can deliver lots of benefits to nature and, and society. Uh, and also understanding the research gaps in the global south for, for this small scale system. So we hope that that would be the fifth legacy. The commission is ending in a couple of weeks. The secretariat will continue to work for two or three months in 2022 to make sure that the handover, the tools, the networks, the information is fully available for others to, to continue our, our work. All, all, all of this work was done by the commissioners, not by me. And it was a, a little, tough to chair a commission uh, without meeting, and, uh, but we met lots of time virtually. So let me thank uh, WLE. Uh, this is a product of WLE. Uh, so on behalf of the commission for making this a reality, I'm confident 
that the CGR and investors in the CGR will continue this, this initial effort uh, as a new research portfolio is being presented to funders. Thank you, Anne. Back to you. Thank you so much, Ruben. And um, I'm getting all sorts of messages from, from the organizers that we don't have time to go back to ask some of the questions, um, second round of questions. I, I just want to say in closing, though, um, as chair of the Independent Steering Committee for the last few years, I am so impressed with how much um, has come out of WLE that we've heard about today, both from the initial panel, but also from uh, the, the folks on this panel, for really what was a tiny investment vis-a-vis -vis the investment that has gone into other parts of the CG agenda. And I just really hope um, that the um, donors to the CG going forward really appreciate just the high level of success that uh, WLE has had and, and that these issues continue to be um, are, are more prominent actually in the research agenda uh, of the one CG going forward. So thank you so much to all of you and um, really a, a lot to chew on and a lot to think about. So uh, back over to you, Marcella. Thank you, thank you, Anne, and also to all the high level panel, panelists that we just have. And after listening uh, today about WLE solutions in a glance, uh, after listening the challenge that we still have to make them more accessible, after listening the broader context uh, nicely laid out by Professor Umber and also all the previous panel insights. And very now, uh, I'm now excited uh, to listen in different voices from very special people to WLE. Uh, we have selected today just a sample of the diverse set of people that has played a key role in the implementation of the program from their different roles. So with this, I want to, to present you who they are, or seven people who are going to present today in three minutes their reflections, they, their take-home reflections. So the first person is Dr. Uh, Andrew Noble former WLE program director from 2012 to 2015. And the other uh, person who's going to be sharing the, it's, his reflections are is Nathaniel Matthews, CEO of the Global Resilience Partnership and former WLE global research manager. Then Dr. Khalifa Traore, scientific director and head of the Institute of Rural Economy in Mali. Then we will have Isabella Cosiel, Deputy Director General of EasyMod and former Program Director of WLE. Then our fifth uh, uh, person is going to be Pravin Parmar, who is going to share a video. Uh, he is Secretary of the Dundi Solar Palm Irrigators Cooperative in India, uh, one of the, the users of one of the WLE solutions. Then we will have Michael Victor, who is currently the head of communication and knowledge management at ILRI and former WLE head of communication. And at the end, we are going to have Jefferson Valencia Gomez, who is research fellow of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT and WLE early career scientist. So with this, let me give the floor first to Dr. Andrew Noble. Please share with us your three minutes take home message. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcella, and uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to reflect on my time as the second director of uh, WLE. Um, at, at the outside, outset, I would like to, to say that it was a privilege to have served in this role during the formative years of the CRPs, and I would like to acknowledge the support and guidance afforded me by the WLE Steering Committee, Management Team, EMI, the Host Center, and the centers that formed the most important constituents of the program. I can distinctly remember addressing a CGIR meeting in Nairobi in November 2013, where WLE was nominated to present the pitch for SLO4, on sustainably managed natural resources on behalf of the CR CRPs that aligned uh, with the SLO. 
I made the following opening statement, and I quote, WLE, along with the CRPs that address this SLO, are of the view that it is the preeminent SLO out of the four and the most difficult to address. This is a bold statement to make and one that will be contested. However, the essence of this SLO is based on the fundamental building blocks of our, our entire food systems namely water, land, biodiversity, and, the, and functional ecosystems. Without these fundamental elements, we do not have a food system." End of quote. As anticipated, the statement drew the ire of several CRP directors and centered DGs, and I was fortunate to be flying out of Nairobi that night and therefore able to avoid further castigation. As I was checking out of my hotel, a gentleman tapped me, tapped me on the shoulder and commenced to congratulate me on the presentation and pitch and fully supported the opening statement that sustainable management of natural resources was the preeminent SLO for the CGIR. That person was Jürgen Vogel, the current chair of the System Council. I still believe that this was and is the most important SLO. I think uh, I probably should uh, leave it there, Marcella, because I've done my time. But uh, I would like to say that there were several highlights, and I congratulate WLE and all of its members in the tremendous work they've done. Thank you, Marcella. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noble. And it's very good to see you here after so many years. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Nathaniel Matthews to share uh, his insights. Dr. Thank Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Marcella. And uh, I'll also keep my insights brief and, and thanks to everyone for having me here. So I came into uh, WLE in, uh, in 2014 as, as quite an outsider coming into the CGIR. And it was also going through you know, this quite a, a significant reform process. And, and from a meta level, um, and not trying to be uncharitable, the, the reform process felt like it was trying to pursue radical change, but it didn't really want to impact on, on current uh, policies and practices. But I, I think we really took that, that radical change um, seriously within WLE and really tried to pursue something different, especially with um, the, the focal region work. And so a lot of people have talked about the specific um, activities on the ground, but there was also a real process change that we were trying to bring in about a co-design process and, and bringing people together and working backwards from a problem to look at solutions instead of trying to bring solutions to a problem, um, which is often a more traditional way to approach things. And, and I think this, you know, moving away from traditional research to, to this sort of approach, um, is really exemplifies a lot of the thinking within the new CGIR, or the one CGIR, I should say. Um, and this is really mentioned by Claudia about, you know, looking at trade-offs and within across systems, but also mentioned, mentioned by uh, Dr. Lenton and really this impact on partnering institutions and a, an entirely new focus on partnership. And that's something we did with the focal regions was really bringing in outside partners that um, the sort of unusual suspects that the CGIR wasn't uh, used to partnering with and bringing together these consortiums. And, and that's really a key component of, of building resilience and, and resilient um, solutions as well as thinking about diversity and, and bringing in inclusivity and equity and having that strong gender focus that Claudia mentioned as well. So I won't take any more time, but I would just like to say that, you know, we're really, I'm really proud of the work that we did with WLE. It was a fantastic team um, that we had together. And I really think we produced, pursued some, some radical change that permeated eventually up through to the one CGI and its thinking. And uh, I'm glad to see that continued in the CG today. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your reflection. 
And now I want to give the floor to Dr. Khalifa Traore, uh, who is the scientific director uh, of IER in Mali, uh, one of the key national partners for WLE. So over to you, Dr. Traore. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going quickly to share some experiences we have uh, with the support of uh, WLE and ICTSAT. And uh, uh, generally, you know, in our countries here, I mean, uh, in West African countries, so we really experience, you know, these high intensity rainfalls. And then this high intensity rainfall lead to uh, runoff and uh, erosion. And it's well known that uh, erosion is uh, uh, very harmful uh, for the, 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 the soil uh, the, because of uh, the, the depth of the, the rooting uh, 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 crops, which is uh, uh, low, and also the infiltration, which is low, the structure, the soil structure, which is destroyed. So uh, erosion is uh, basically due to the fact that uh, we have our uh, seasonality in cropping system, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, a situation we expose uh, our lands to uh, weather uh, damages, and then these weather damages you know, lead to land degradation. So to face this uh, constraint, uh, in collaboration with uh, ICRISAT, uh, we develop a technology uh, so-called uh, uh, agroforestry-based uh, control bonding, which uh, is a technology who reduce, uh, which reduce the runoff and then uh, reduce also uh, uh, erosion. So uh, in the collaboration of uh, uh, with uh, ICRISAT and with the support of uh, WLE. So we perform measurement on the ground. And then this measurement uh, allow us to see with the, uh, but with the use of this uh, technology, we can reduce erosion uh, up to four ton per hectare. While in the control, we reach 12 ton per hectare. This is a, a very, 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 uh, important degradation, which uh, can uh, compromise all the development plan of the government. So with the technology, uh, we use uh, uh, agroforestry uh, tree species, fast growing tree species, which can help uh, to strengthen the structures of uh, the development we are implementing on the field, but also which can uh, provide fodder for animals, you know, uh, generally, at the beginning of the rainy season, uh, the drove animals are weak because uh, of, of a short uh, of uh, uh, fodder, and also the same problem is uh, seen with uh, the uh, the small ruminant. So we use this uh, agroforestry tree species to feed them, so that they can help farmers, the small uh, scale farmer, to implement uh, their, their crop, and uh, also a similar. Uh, experience were performed with uh, uh, over agriculture, agricultural uh, services working in Segu and Sikasso area with the help of International Water Management Institute. So we get similar results uh, showing that we have uh, a beneficial effect of the technology on crop yield, I mean, sorghum yield, millet yield, and uh, cotton yield. And after that, so we try to uh, measure the, the, at the landscape level what is the impact of the technology? And then we see that the technology have a, a great impact on water table. For instance, uh, when we are in the, in the plot uh, under the technology, the water table uh, is only two meters from the soil surface. But if we are in the control plot, you reach four meters. That means the water table is four meters down. So these, all these uh, uh, results uh, you know, have to show that uh, uh, we have a dynamic at the landscape uh, uh, level. And then when we talk about landscape, that means we talk also about a holistic manner to uh, tackle the problem. Uh, before I, uh, I, I stop here, so I want to thank very much uh, uh, WLE for supporting uh, our research uh, activities. Also, we want to thank the uh, Africa Rising Project, uh, ITISAT, and EMI through the uh, TAT program who help us to manage these uh, water issues. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Traore. And it's very satisfying to, to listen, I mean, changes that had happened in, in the ground. Uh, and thanks for, for this uh, great partnership. And now I would like to give the floor to Isabella Cosiel, who has who was for, former program director of the LLE, and now who can see this from outside in his in her new role as deputy director general of ECMOT. Isabella, over to you. Thank you, Marcella, and good evening from Kathmandu in Nepal, where I am now based as DDG of the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. And, and overseeing work which has, has very close links to the kind of work that, that WLE does. And uh, thank you for the invite today. And great to see so many former colleagues on, online. Um, and it is only eight months since I left WLE, although it seems a little bit longer ago than that. But I, I'm so glad to see the program continuing to make such great strides and of course including making great inroads into the new CGIR portfolio so congratulations to all for, for that work and and just to reflect um, I was program director of WLE for just under five years and and I joined WLE because of what WLE was trying to do even if at the time it, it was somehow sitting at the margins of the CGIR. And I, I joined WLE because I believe that the, the core objective of what we were trying to do was and, and remains extremely powerful, how to produce more nutritious food more sustainably, whilst also ensuring that its innovations support the poorest and most vulnerable far farmers first and foremost. And we just heard from, from Ruben how this area is underinvested in terms of it being only 7% of all innovation in investment. But, but what is it that, that strikes me most about WLE? I think this was a program that was way ahead of its time. And despite the odds against WLE initially, as we've heard, it was one of the smallest programs in the CGIR. There was many, a lot of counter inertia to taking it forward. And we faced many challenges that were put in our, our way. Uh, but WLE has really brought in the recognition of the need for sustainability and equity in food and agriculture systems. And it's brought this to the highest level in CGIR's new mandate. And it has also, at the same time, crucially delivered tangible solutions, um, whether that's on waste management, water management, land restoration, or more sustainable use of, of biodiversity. And it's brought these solutions to many partners across Africa, Asia, and, and, and Latin America. And so, so what do I think that this success can be attributed to? Um, it was a program that was not afraid of tackling complexity and real challenges faced by farmers on the ground. It brought together a team and a unique team of highly committed individuals from right across different partners in the CGIR as well as outside. And of course, it brought with it some very committed donors with, without whom none of this would have been possible. And it was prepared to support work at the interface of disciplines to try and deliver these, these fairly new, innovative, integrated and, and cross-scale solutions, which we all know is extremely challenging, but we didn't give up. Um, and of course, we kept focusing on these solutions to some of the most difficult, intractable, or let's say wicked challenges, rather than describing the problems. And we also made sure that we really invested in outreach and smart communications. And I accept that maybe more or less still needs to be done, but we, we've tried our best. And finally, we enjoyed it. Well, at least I enjoyed it working with you all and I miss you all. And thank you for inviting me today and wish you every success with the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Isabella, and also very encouraging for 
what is coming ahead and of not being afraid of that complexity as Lee is highlighting in the chat right now. With this, I, 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 I want to share with you a message from a video from Pravin Parmar. He's from a cooperative in India that, yes, is, is an ex user of WLE, but more than an ex user, is one of the key partners on the ground that make possible uh, to realize impact in, in programs like uh, WLE. So let's listen to this video. EMI, Tata Trust, CCAPS, WLE, नाम की संस्थाओं के सहयोग से हमारे गांव में सौर ऊर्जा उत्पादक सहकारी मंडली जो विश्व की सौ प्रथम सौर ऊर्जा मंडली है उसको बनाया इस मंडली में हमारे साथ नौ किसान लोग जुड़े हैं वो किसान अपने खेत में सोलर सिस्टम से अपना पंप चलाते हैं और बची हुई बिजली गवर्नमेंट को बेचते हैं मंडली को जो तीन किलोमीटर के एरिया में लगी है उसका हर एक का मीटर एक हमने कंट्रोल रूम बनाया है उस कंट्रोल रूम में हम हर एक का मीटर देखते हैं उसमें ये किसान कितना यूनिट बेचा है वो भी यहाँ पता चल जाता है इसमें हम पंद्रह डीजल पंप बंद हो गए हैं तो उसमें प्रदूषण आज हमारे गांव में नहीं हो रहा पर इस सोलर सिस्टम आने की वजह से हमारे किसानों की एक साल में एक से डेढ़ लाख रुपये की इनकम केवल इस सोलर सिस्टम से हो रही है गुजरात के एनर्जी मिनिस्टर सौरभ भाई पटेल मई 2018 में उस मंडली की मुलाकात की उन्होंने जून 2018 में गुजरात के लिए 33 जिलों में एक सौ फील्डर पर स्काई योजना लॉन्च की तो ये देखकर केंद्र सरकार ने आज कुसुम योजना भी लॉन्च की बाहर से एम्बेसडर डेलीगेशन ऐसे कौर लोग आ चुके हैं 650 से ज़्यादा विजिट हो चुकी है बाहर से किसानों को दिखाने के लिए और संस्थाएं भी किसानों को लेके आते हैं एक किसान को एक महीने में एक पूरे साल में बीस से पच्चीस हज़ार रुपये का खर्चा लगता था वो आज खर्चा जीरो हो गया है तो इसी से हमारी सोलर मंडली से कई मंडलियाँ अभी गुजरात में भी बन रही है तो ऐसा कहना है कि ऐसी मंडलियाँ पूरे विश्व में भी भी बननी चाहिए अस्तु जय हिंद Great. Now that's that's good to see change on the ground again. And all now I want to uh, also share with you another video uh, shared by Michael Victor. Michael Victor was former WLE head of communications, and as Isabella noted, communications are key as well in these programs that are researched for for impact. Let's listen to this one. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Victor, and I'm the, currently the head of communications and knowledge management at ILRI. Uh, and from 2010 to about 2017, I played a role in communications at uh, WLE. I'm sorry I can't be there, uh, but I'm happy to spend a couple minutes to look at some of the key reflections, I, key lessons learned that I learned at WLE that I think could be really important for uh for CGIR moving forward. So the first is being visionary. When we started out in 2010, we started with a very abstract and hard to grasp concept, ecosystem-based services and sustainable intensification. And we were wanting to have a paradigm shift in the way people thought about this with agriculture. This was revolutionary for the CGIR at the time, and there was a lot of resistance and misunderstanding about what ecosystem-based approaches were and how to use within the agriculture context. This was an important framing for WLE as a cross-cutting program rather than just as a water program as well. Uh, in order to create this paradigm shift, we need a revolution. And revolutions aren't just started with theories of change or steering committees or Marlow. Uh, changing, and one way to do this is through changing discourses. And this is a powerful way to change the system. So this is what we set out doing, and this is where risk-taking, the second area, comes into play. So early on in WLE, uh, we didn't have stories and we didn't have messages, uh, and the message we were trying to convey were still evolving. So we instead of trying, so instead of trying to promote the program, we use key principles of knowledge management to work out loud and create conversations. From this, we created the Thrive blog, which at its heart was meant to create a new discourse on how we think about uh, food and agriculture and the environment. 
this was quite revolutionary at the time. The idea that we talked about messaging out loud, that we had different perspectives and the vo uh, and different voices about uh, agriculture and sometimes competing or contradictory ways. We might even talk about very hot topics such as hydropower, farm size, and uh, kind of really what does sustainable intensification mean? Uh, and you know, from this, uh, we really helped to uh, evolve our messaging. We started out with something called Kuznets Curve and then moved to sustainable intensification and then to ecosystem-based approaches and finally into uh, agri-food systems in 2016, which was five years ahead of time before the U United Nations Food System Summit became Food System Summit. Uh, so Thrive Blog and the idea of working out loud really helped the, the program evolve itself. And you could see this through the number of views that we had, as well as we had more than 170 authors from 70 institutions uh, that, that got involved in the blog. Uh, finally, uh, the third area is that in order to achieve the mission, we really need to see communications and engagement as part of the research process. Uh, so for science to achieve the CGIR mission, comms and engage, engagement really have to be embedded into the research process and linked to the development outcomes. I think this is another impact that we had at WLE, whether it was in the design of the regional programs with Nate or working closely with scientists to co-develop communication products that could be used in their engagement processes to achieve the outcomes that they were looking for. Uh, and I think this will be key in the way we interact in the new one CGIR between the global uh, level, the region and country levels, and with the new research initiatives. Comms can really play a key role as the glue to bring them together, as well as to support the outcomes that they want to have. So my hope in the one CGIR is that the baby is not thrown out with the bathwater and the lessons that we learned in all the CRPs, not just WLE, uh, about comms and how comms can be embedded in the science is really kind of actively used uh, and that we find new spaces or build upon w, you know, the Thrive blog to create spaces where scientists can really think out loud and work together and to build that collaboration space. Uh, and finally, I'd like to uh, thank everyone at WLE, particularly uh, Andrew and even Simon Cook for really taking the the risk uh, to really bring comms to the forefront, and Isabel, who really carried that forward. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all the scientists who really like supported us, whether that was Claudia or Debbie, Fabrice, Kim, and even Pai, who was one of our biggest uh, champions at the end. Uh, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the staff that really played a great role. Uh, and that was Mia and Abby, Ilsa, Martina, Marianne, Deepak, Udana. Uh, and Adam as well, uh, who actually really did the work and kept us on track. So thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity, and I really look forward to seeing how we can uh, build upon WLE and a lot of the other CRPs as we move CGIR forward. Great, great words from, from Michael. I want to rescue what he said, that is changing this course is risky but it's worthy. And I think that really has demonstrated this. So after this 10 year journal, I, a journey, I think we have, we have get older. Also we have get, be more, gain more experience, but at the same time, we have had the chance to, to mentor the new generation of scientists. So with this, I want to give the floor to Jefferson Valencia, a WLE early career scientist. Thank you, Marcela. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, so I would like to start by saying that uh, since 2015, I have had the opportunity to be involved in WLE. At that time, we were designing and developing water-related platforms, systems, and tools by request and with the support of USAID. All these tools and information platforms have been awarded and highlighted in WLE and elsewhere. For, for instance, the Aguanduras platform and the agri a uh, rainwater harvesting tool. More importantly, by working with partners in the ground and closely to USAID mission in Honduras, I have had the opportunity to start witnessing the impact of these, community, of these developments on communities' livelihoods. This proves the value of research and development of partnerships. Agri, for example, has been widely spread out to different regions in the world during the last two years, especially in developing countries. 
Being part of WLE has facilitated the connection with researchers in Africa who have been key to deploy and expand this tool to that region. So we move from Latin America to Africa and coming soon to the Caribbean. My involvement in the development of these novel platforms and the corresponding, or, and the corresponding projects has widely contributed to enrich my expertise in water resources management and has allowed me to put my previous knowledge into practice. Definitely, WLE has been stimulated and forming a school for my career as a scientist. Moreover, the work supported by WLE enabled me and other young scientists to lay the foundation for a great future career as researchers or professionals to make an impact in the world and making it a better place for all people and the environment. Finally, it has been an honor to be involved in this excellent program. While working on its projects and initiatives, I have had the opportunity to collaborate with experts of WLE and contribute to some sustainable development goals, especially in drought prone areas, as for example, the Central America Dry Corridor, where many of these tools and platforms were born. Thank you so much again, and the best for you all. Thank you, Jefferson, and the future is ahead. And with this, after listening to these reflections, I want now to give the floor to Dr. Uh, Mark Smith, current uh, Director General of IMI. IMI, as you know, has led WLE, but more importantly, I think I, it has convened a very strong partnership that has made uh, able to reach impact on the ground after 10 years. So Dr. Smith, uh, over to you and very happy to listen to your closing remarks. Uh, thank you so much, Marcela. And yeah, I'm going to begin my remarks with a lot of uh, uh, expressions of thanks. So I, I want to thank everyone who has taken part today. We had about 160 participants online uh, at one point. I thank all the speakers, Olche, and all contributors. You have really ably and really compellingly framed the legacy of WLE's research for development, but also the, the importance and enormity of the challenges that lie ahead for water systems, for food systems, for ecosystems in the era of climate change and global systems change that we are entering. Thank you also to the many partners that WLE has worked with uh, at national, regional and global levels you have all added immeasurably to the achievements of this program. And Chair and Tuckweiler and current uh, members of the ISC, Diane Holdorf, Sasha Kuoshima, Joe Puri and Brent Swallow, and past members and chairs of the ISC, thank you on behalf of IMI and WLE leadership, past and present, for your guidance and wisdom uh, that you've provided to the program. So continuing with my acknowledgements, uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge the CGIR Windows 2 donors to WLE, ACR, DGIS, uh, STC, FCDO, uh, CEDA, thank you for your partnership and for your generous support to the program over so, so very many years. To the leadership and the staff of WLE, past and present, and the management committee and flagship leaders and all contributing scientists, you are too numerous to name, but as WLE draws to a close, I hope you feel great pride in your accomplishments and achievements. These CGIR research programs, they are really not easy beasts. Uh, but in the presentation today and in the synthesis products that are in preparation, there is clear evidence that you've delivered a rich and impactful program. But of course, this is not the end. We are at an inflection point in the global agenda. 2021 has been the critical year for a critical decade for the future of our planet. And the science-based solutions from WLE are making contributions to driving the change that we need and are positioned to make more change. Changes we need, for example, around, as we've heard, across irrigation management and innovation, inclusion and gender equality, soils management and soil health, landscape restoration, wetland conservation and agrobiodiversity, sustainable intensification and food systems change. Uh, what a resilience uh, to climate change. And as Olche uh, highlighted so clearly, science doing better at informing policy. Indeed, as Roberto mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, as a consequence of the growing demand for such solutions, 
as the world confronts the converging challenges of food systems transformation, uh, the biodiversity crisis, climate change and water security, and WLE's successes and, and impacts. One of the legacies of WLE, as we've heard mentioned a few times, is that it has provided a, a, really, a really important and firm basis for one CGIR's mission of delivering science to transform food, land and water systems. For WLE, therefore, where we are in the inflection right now in 2021, um, is, that we, uh, is that one CGIR initiatives will now take up the mantle and continue to build on WLE and deliver science-based solutions that, that the world is demanding. So on behalf of INI, uh, let me close by then saying we've led WLE for 10 years and recognize and value the tremendous legacy that the program as it draws to a close, leaves now in our hands. And our task is now to make sure that with WLE's partners, we succeed in carrying that legacy forward internally into one CGIR and its initiatives, as well as externally to scaling the innovations and impacts from WLE and turning them into, as Ruben said, turning them into real action. Uh, we will not do that alone. We will do that with all of you and the community and networks that surround us. On that note, let me express one final note of thanks uh, to the team that organized uh, to today's event, led by Stefan Ullenbrook and Claudia Ringler. A big effort, uh, but very well worth it and very much appreciated. So with that, I would like to hand back to you, Marcelo. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. and for these closing remarks. And now I want to close the symposium uh, with a video that demonstrates, demonstrates how we can do research for development to build hope and resilience in dry lands. After the video, then the symposium is closed. Thank you everyone. And please put the video. Bundelkhand region of central India is known for undulated topography low and uncertain rainfall. It is also a hot spot of poverty. The traditional method of agriculture in this region is called Haveli cultivation. Havelis are traditional rainwater harvesting systems which originated during the Bundela dynasty over 400 years ago and have become obsolete due to apathy and lack of proper management. This has affected the groundwater availability, leading to acute water scarcity during most part of the year. Declining annual rainfall, deforestation, and land degradation have further aggravated the situation here. In order to address these challenges, ICRISAT and its partners have developed eight sites of learning, each of 5,000 hectares located in the seven districts of Bundalkan in Uttar Pradesh. The project is being supported by the government of Uttar Pradesh, where several science-based natural resource management interventions are implemented on ground. These include large-scale field bonding with agroforestry, particularly at uplands, farm ponds on individual fields, laser leveling of lands, desilting of drainage lines, etc. However, the focus is on rejuvenation of community ponds and Haveli cultivation system. Stone masonry core wall was built along the boundaries beneath the earthen embankment, and masonry outlet was constructed at appropriate locations to dispose of excess runoff. Some of the Haveli structures were connected with large farm ponds laying pipelines beneath. Primary and secondary peripheral drainage networks were deepened and widened with suitable nala plugs to harvest surface runoff in a decentralized manner over the landscape. A range of landscape and farm level natural resource conservation measures helped to enhance surface and groundwater availability. Over 12 million cubic meter of water per year has been harvested in the project area which is equivalent to 35 millimeters water depth. Out of 35,000 hectare geographical area, about 2,000 hectare of permanent fallows was converted into productive cultivation and about 9,000 hectare of seasonal fallow has been brought into double cropping. Overall, the cropping intensity has increased from 110% to 170%. The well recovery period has declined from 50 hours to 15 hours. Productivity of the different crops has increased in the range of 20 to 60 percent. With increased moisture availability and groundwater table, diesel consumption and costs of supplemental irrigation has declined by 30 percent. As a result, 
The overall farmer's income has increased by 40 to 140 percent over the baseline status. Integration of climate resilient technologies at landscape and field levels holds huge potential to be harnessed in dryland systems of Asia and Africa. This helps speed up the journey towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for the year 2030.